I'd like to thank lyricists for having this program. I think it's very important to see what's happening in certainly in your local area and figuring out ways in the wider audience how you yourself can be responsible and play a, a, a actually really a great role in trying to get collective, uh, collaborative work going in emergency preparedness. Um, I live, breathe, and someday I'll die in disasters, but um, it's something that I feel very passionate about, and it was really my getting to this point started, you know, I have a very checkered past going from elementary education to uh, book production to fell, falling into preservation, um, handbook binding, and then finally getting to disasters, and I think I've, I've found my niche. And I think it's a really, um, my husband likes to say that I am the vice president of disasters, and I have to correct him, no, 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 it's not really, that's just our life, honey, don't worry. So I'm going to be talking about Heritage Preservation, which is a national nonprofit that advocates for the protection of uh, cultural and historic resources. And I want to give you an overview of what we do at the national level, um, how we help foster what's going on at the very local level, um, but also try to provide guidance. There were some really great questions that arose and challenges that were discussed that I hope we'll have a chance to cover in the Q&A. And um, from the perspective from the national level, there are others, I mean, you are not alone. There are others in your, in your communities, in your states. There are other people who are facing the exact same challenges. And one of the great things from the national level is the ability to say, well, you know, this is how this community solved that problem, or this is how that state is doing it. So um, one of the things that I really relish about this job is learning about having the light bulb go off and learning about great activities that are being undertaken at the local and state level. And um, there's a great term that I actually ripped off from the uh, emergency manager from Chatham County in Georgia. He calls it R&D, rip off and duplicate. Because <laughs> as we all know, there's no funding in any of this. I mean, we are all in it for the passion. And if we're really lucky, we can get some bit of funding. And so why reinvent the wheel when everyone is really moving towards the same goal? So being able to R&D what's happening is, is part of what we do, um, provide R&D uh, to other, to everyone else uh, at the national level through heritage preservation. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on what we do and how we responded during Sandy to let you know that we will be there. We will have your back when something happens. So Heritage Preservation provides a wealth of resources to help you prepare for and respond to disasters. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with many of these, these activities. Um, every year, we encourage cultural heritage institutions to do one simple activity to celebrate May Day, which is the national campaign to promote emergency preparedness. How many of you do that at your institutions here? It's very, very easy. You just have to do one simple thing, whether it's getting um, fire extinguisher training, call an emergency, a first responder in to give you some training, whether it's reviewing a disaster plan, whether it's starting a disaster plan if you don't have one. Um, it's very simple. It's, it's a low cost, no cost activity, and it really does help advance you that way forward. When emergencies happen, we now have the Emergency Response and Salvage app, which was based on the Emergency Response and Salvage wheel. And this is available free of charge for Apple, Android, and BlackBerry devices. And Heritage Preservation's Alliance Response Initiative is now in its 10th year and continues to demonstrate the power of partnerships. And I think Christine did a great job demonstrating how that partnership works. So since 2003, Alliance for Response has been building bridges at the local level between the cultural heritage and emergency management communities. The goal is to bring cultural and emergency professionals together before disasters happen and to establish a cultural heritage emergency network at the local level. And so that's, um, I really encourage you to participate and become a member of HERA or if you're um, closer to um, Savannah, to be involved in the Savannah region, or for those of you who are in the uh, online community, to find, uh, uh, unfortunately they're not everywhere, but to find uh, an emergency network that is close to you that you can start learning from and partic certainly participating in. 
This program has been generously supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities as well as by the Fidelity Foundation, and it's reached more than 800 museums, libraries, archives, and historic institutions in 20 cities and two states. And the two states were um, large states which had uh, far fewer cultural institutions, so that would be Vermont and Utah. Just this past year, we had three launch forums in Minneapolis, St. Paul, which was in February. <laughs> I grew up in Hawaii, and having <laughs> temperatures below zero is just not right. And so the people in Minnesota were walking around with their coats open, and I was freezing my butt off. Okay, so that was, but it was a great, it was a great um, meeting, and everyone, uh, the com cultural community, got introduced to the emergency management community, and they're moving forward with a lot of activities to help. Uh, the cultural institutions prepare for disasters. Uh, the next one was in Northwest Pennsylvania in June. Um, it was raining so hard that our emergency manager had to leave right afterwards because there was a flooding alert that he had to attend to. But he was able to do his, at least he stayed through his session before he had to leave. And in Miami, finally, sunny Miami in June, how, how good could that be? Well, thanks to an unnamed airline, I, two of my flights were canceled, so I didn't get there. I was thinking, oh, a little beach time, a little pool time. No, 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 I got there in time for dinner. Um, but in, in Miami, they had the former director of the National Hurricane Center, Max Mayfield, attend and talk about um, his experiences, both as a person who has gone through disasters, certainly many, many hurricanes, as well as his perspective on what's li what it's like trying to coordinate that at the national level. Pretty impressive. So the existing emergency networks have been making great strides in preparedness, and certainly HERA is an example of that, offering training, often in conjunction with emergency managers, by applying for and receiving community and federal grants to improve readiness and response by cultural institutions, and by creating annexes to state emergency plans for the protection of cultural and historical resources. The Heritage Emergency National Task Force, and I'm going to call this task force from this point forward because it's such a mouthful. Um, it was established to promote preparedness by America's cultural community and historic preservation community. Members include, I'm not going to name all 42 of them, don't worry, um, the, our most recent member uh, joining, which is one that we should have had as a member many, many, many years ago, the Chief Officers of State Library Agencies, COSLA, National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Archives, American Alliance of Museums, National Park Service, National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, Small Business Administration, and the National Emergency Management Association. FEMA co-sponsors Heritage Preservation uh, with Heritage Preservation, the task force, which really underscores FEMA's commitment to helping reduce the impact of disasters, not just on the business community, not just on individuals, but on those of us who are in the nonprofit world. Um, because we all know, we certainly know, that the nonprofit world, the museums, the libraries, the archives are part and parcel of every community. And if that segment of the community can't rebound following a recovery, uh, following a disaster, then that city, that community will never, ever be the same. So as a result of the major disasters this past year, we've been in constant contact with FEMA. After a relatively calm April, there was an outbreak of tornadoes across the nation's midsection. On the morning of May 20, a two-mile-wide EF5 tornado tore through the Oklahoma City of Moore. Oklahoma City suburb, and so this is an aerial view on May 21st. <clears throat> and this, unfortunately, is an all too common scene nowadays. One of the primary goals of the task force is to assist the public in recovering family heirlooms, photos, and other keepsakes following a disaster. Heritage Preservation, on behalf of the task force, immediately issued a media release that provided advice to the public on saving damaged family treasures. And when that happens in your community, um, if it rises to the level of a presidentially declared disaster, so it won't be just your community, it will be probably a, a region, a, a wide swath of your area, um, we will be there to help you. So 
give me a call and we'll help you. That, you know, we don't have the resources, but we'll certainly be able to direct you to them and help you prepare some um, if you need them. In late October, another disaster brewed, this time of epic proportions, and preparations were made up and down the East Coast. Um, here in Margate, New Jersey, which I think is a great image, and here in front of an art studio on the waterfront in Brooklyn. And isn't that cute? <laughs> did, they, did they know that there'd be a photographer there to capture them? So this is a picture of uh, John Cronin and his four-year-old son, Miles, sealing the entrance to his wife's art studio on the waterfront in the Brooklyn borough of New York. Um, and you know what happened there. I'll show you. Um, hurricane Sandy was the deadliest hurricane to hit the northeast U.S. in 40 years. Uh, and the second costliest in the nation's history, certainly after Katrina. By the time it made landfall in New Jersey, its gale force winds spanned a diameter of about 1,000 miles. And um, I'm sure all of you disaster geeks, like me, were watching following Hurricane Typhoon Haiyan and recognized that that, I mean, this was nothing compared to the width of, of Typhoon Haiyan, and if, if our country, when our country gets affected by something like that, we're going to have some serious issues to have to address. And so it makes sense to just start doing a little preparation at the local level and certainly at the individual level, the family level, and, and we're starting to, to work really hard to get to that point where we feel a little more comfortable about being able to address that. The highest storm surge measured by tide gauges in New Jersey was eight and a half feet above normal levels at Sandy Hook, though it likely was higher because the storm surge knocked out the gauges. The highest surge in New York was more than 12 and a half feet at Kings Point on the western edge of Long Island Sound. And this is a picture under Manhattan Bridge in the Dumbo section of Brooklyn. Flooding at the National September 11 Memorial Museum, which is below the Memorial Plaza at the World Trade Center. One of the things that Heritage Preservation, um, this was another one of these aha moments. Um, many, many of the organizations that were affected, actually the people that were affected were not organizations, but were um, galleries, art galleries and artists. And this is one of those, duh, you know, we need to widen that circle. We need to include them in all this planning. And there is a huge effort already underway um, but led by the arts community to address the issues that are very specific to artists and performing arts organizations. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of the activities that happened as a result of Hurricane Sandy. So this is a, a picture outside a gallery in Chelsea. This is the main room of the Peninsula Branch of Queen's Library. While Sandy brought devastation to the West Coast, to the East Coast, sorry, principally New York and New Jersey, it created wind gusts as far west as Wisconsin and as far north as Canada, and actually caused water levels to rise from Florida to Maine. This is a picture of a pedestrian bridge at Rough Point, Rhode Island. And it's part of a cliff walk along the coast in Newport, Rhode Island, which was decimated and is closed indefinitely until major repairs can be completed. So we don't really think of a pedestrian walk as a cultural resource, um, but the loss of the cliff walk has a tremendous impact on the heritage tourism for the city because it's a major, major attraction for visitors. There are many, um, if you've ever been there, there are many great um, estates along that cliff walk, and to be able to see um, what it was like back then is, is phenomenal, and now that really is impossible. The damage indirectly affects cultural resources because it crosses so many historic properties, as I've said, and these can't be accessed along that walk anymore. And those would include the Newport Preservation Society and the Newport Restoration Foundation. The HMS Bounty, a 180-foot sailboat, sank in the Atlantic Ocean approximately 90 miles southeast of Hatteras, North Carolina. And this was tragic. Um, they rescued 14 of the 16 uh, crew. Uh, they finally found uh, the 15th person, um, but she was unresponsive, and they believe the captain chose to go down with the ship. So that's really tragic. 
Here, too, is a scene all too common in the Northeast. Um, going through, rescuing, salvaging what you can. And here's another interesting cultural resource. This is a heavily damaged carousel that sits inside Keensburg Amusic Amusement Park in Keensburg, New Jersey. The Bergen County Historical Society in New Jersey prepared. The night before the storm, the past president of the Historical Society, uh, Kevin Wright, and his wife drove to the Society's warehouse where they had many of their materials stored. So they removed drawers and placed them on top of cabinets and lifted as much as they could onto tables, and that still wasn't enough. Hurricane Sandy sent 40 inches of water into their warehouse, soaking a collection of clothing, 19th century toys, a set of George Washington's writings, and countless other artifacts accumulated over the society's 110-year history. It was two weeks before they could get assistance to recover their collections, and so obviously mold was a huge factor when they were finally able to address and respond to their collections. They were able to salvage many of their items, and many of them would be what we would consider ordinary, a doll, a chest, a set of chairs, but that's what makes them precious, Kevin Wright said, and I quote, artifacts as well as documents are what make a human connection to the past. They're the tangible reminder that people of the past had the same human qualities, foibles, talents as we do today. So you really can't ever get back to where you were before. Heritage Preservation, on behalf of the task force, prepared in advance of the storm as well. Um, I'm going to switch into emergency management um, acronyms. I'll try to remember to, to say them all out. But um, I think um, I, I know emergency managers are so great because, you know, they're used to acting. We in the cultural community, I know when we had our Alliance for Response meeting in Boston, the cultural heritage community at one point, the speakers, the cultural stewards, were running the program way late. They were speaking on and droning on because we love to talk about our collections and what we do. The emergency managers were in, they delivered, and they left. They were on time or early, they were great. So um, part of the fun of this position is learning about the emergency management community. And um, it's not just fun, it's something that I encourage everyone to do because we can't, the cultural community cannot proceed to attend to disasters um, without having some sort of collaboration, some association um, with the emergency managers. Because when th things are bad, the emergency managers, the first responders, loom large and are in charge. And if you don't have a relationship with your first responders um, at your institution, they're certainly not going to be letting you into the building to do some anything. And so um, one of the one of this common saying, sayings is, um, you, you're not, you shouldn't exchange business cards outside a disaster at your institution. You really need to have that relationship established long before anything bad happens. They um, are a wealth of information, um, have great stories to tell about what has gone right and what has gone wrong, um, and they are there to help you. That is their job, and if you can make their job easier, all the more important. So we do that at the federal level by being a support agency of emergency support function number 11, or ESF 11, to the National Response Framework, NRF, um, which is one of five national planning frameworks. So there are huge, all-encompassing frameworks uh, that correspond to five preparedness mission areas. Prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. And for those of us who've been in the business for a while, there were only four for a while, <laughs> and my graphics all had to change. Um, mitigation is now something that is being recognized as, really, if you can prevent things from happening and reduce the, the chance of something happening, um, you'll be saving so many more dollars than trying to recover after the fact. So we coordinate closely with one of the primary agencies, which is uh, the Department of the Interior. The other primary agency is the Department of Agriculture. And ESF 11 has always been considered kind of a dumping ground for where do you stick cultural resources? What, what is that? And so I like to think of it um, with the Agriculture and the Department of Interior, mad cow disease, Libraries. I mean, it's just really <laughs> no offense to any libraries or librarians. 
The task force has a former role in the recovery process as well. So the task force is a supporting organization of the National Disaster Recovery Framework. There are six recovery support functions, and the one that we fall under is natural and cultural resources. So in FEMA speak, it's the NDRF, NCR, RSF. And I just love to be able to string that together in an email to FEMA people. So the fact that one of them focuses on cultural heritage really de is demonstrating that the federal government has been factoring cultural resources into its planning, which is a huge advancement. Hurricane Katrina changed everything. So we are moving forward slowly, but it's very important to recognize that we need to be working with FEMA, we need to be working with state emergency management agencies to forward our goals to protect the, the collections that we hold dear. Um, another positive development, FEMA hired a natural and cultural resource planner as part of the Sandy recovery team in New York City, which is also a huge development because there's always someone who's in charge of, of infrastructure, housing, um, economics. I mean, those are certainly part and parcel of recovery. But the fact that they um, have someone who's devoting their energy to cultural resources is tremendous. And her charge includes assessing and coordinating resources, not just for the cultural institutions that were impacted by Sandy, but also for the artist, artist slash um, artist creative community. So these would include visual artists, performing artists, musicians, dancers, theater groups, dance groups, and related arts um, organizations. And it's great because they are part and parcel in an organization. A, a community is not going to be complete. It's not going to be whole again unless they are complete. And they provide so much energy as part of the recovery process that it's important that um, FEMA recognize them. So following um, Hurricane Sandy, the task force delegates are notified to see if, um, to contact Heritage Preservation to let us know if they know of any cultural institutions or historic sites or properties that were affected by Sandy. And Heritage Preservation also convened a conference call for task force members, state cultural agencies, and state and federal emergency management agencies to discuss response and recovery efforts. The goals of the conference calls included to facilitate a coordinated response on behalf of the cultural community and to ensure that the needs of cultural institutions are identified and the resources are located to address those needs. Again, Heritage Preservation doesn't have the resources to actually supply to the institutions, but we can certainly serve as a communications hub, as a network um, nexus to enable people to connect um, through people we know, organizations that do similar work, so forth. We assisted affected institutions by directing them to train volunteers, and so that would be members, that would include members of the American Institute for, Con American Institute for Conservation Collections Emergency Response Team, AIC CERT. Um, and advice was also provided by staff at federal agencies, such as the Library of Congress, who can provide advice on stabilization, salvage and recovery of damaged collections, holdings, and historic properties. And we compiled an extensive list of resources and put them online. And the links are shown in the right-hand column. We worked with FEMA and the Small Business Administration to ensure that key sections of the online version of this publication were up to date. And, it made sh and we made sure that it was widely disseminated. Um, most, I would say, on nearly all cultural institutions have not a clue what to do following a major disaster. And there is disaster aid out there, but if you don't know the steps on how to get through it, there are certainly deadlines that you have to observe, and the federal government will not stretch deadlines, certain deadlines. Um, they might extend them, uh, but certainly you need to pay attention to those deadlines and know what it is that is required of you. So this publication is available on Heritage Preservation's website. It's a free publication. It's available online. And... Um, you need to know what it is that you need to do following disaster, um, what kinds of documents to have prepared, what kind of documents to be able to take with you in an emergency go kit. So you have this information as you start compiling, um, going through the paperwork and, and, and the process of recovery if you're intending to apply for disaster aid from the federal government. 
We worked with a joint field office in New Jersey to compile a master database of all the affected institutions and historic properties. Um, this certainly wasn't as comprehensive as one would like. Um, we drew from damage reports that were reported by the institutions themselves, um, reports that were compiled that were uh, collected by state agencies about their constituents. Uh, FEMA had personnel in the field that they were able to um, help populate this, this uh, spreadsheet, media reports, emails, anything that we could locate, we tried to put up here. To a lesser extent, uh, we did the same in New York. We relied very heavily on the damage reports that were collected by the Alliance for Response New York City, which was certainly a tremendous um, asset to have uh, in working hand in glove with the emergency management agency in New York City. We helped translate FEMA ease so that its policies were much more understandable to cultural stewards, most of whom had never sought federal disaster aid before and had certainly never encountered FEMA or SBA uh, disaster aid policies. So, I mean, how many of you even knew that Small Business Administration was something that you had to, was, a, was an agency you had to deal with? Yay. <laughs> you must have gone through a disaster there, Anne. <laughs> um, we worked with FEMA to put together a fact sheet on eligibility for disaster aid and what FEMA can and cannot do to help support private nonprofits. In late August of last year, the Institute of Museum and Library Services awarded Heritage Preservation um, Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program Grant. And the goal of this project, which we called the State Heritage Emergency Partnership, um, the goals of the project included forging strong partnerships between the cultural and emergency management agencies at the state level, while um, Alliance for Response is at the local level, the community level. This is at the state level. And another goal was to get state cultural agencies and their emergency management agency to begin identifying their roles and responsibilities in protecting cultural heritage following a major disaster. And our partner in this grant um, is COSLA, the Chief Officers of State Library Agencies. So this past spring, we held three forums organized by FEMA region. And this was um, kind of like <coughs> Sophie's choice. We really wanted to have all 50 states and the territories participate, but obviously we did not have that kind of funding to do that. So we had to pick and choose um, which states were available and were, uh, which ones uh, could send people to attend. And um, Georgia, unfortunately, was not chosen, but we tried to get a, a standard baseline established. So we knew that Georgia has, has already, is already well on its way with Hera and with Cher. So um, we had to bypass Georgia. Hopefully, we'll be able to do the, another round of forums and get Georgia on board. Uh, we organize them by FEMA region because when a major disaster happens, we want to be able to coordinate with FEMA. So it was also important for the FEMA representatives, the regional environmental officers, to know who to be in touch with at the state level so they can be in touch with them directly. Um, unfortunately, this was right um, around sequestration, and so FEMA representatives weren't able to travel unless they were located in the city that the... Um, forum was held, so that was a bummer. But I have to say the regional environmental officers of both FEMA and the Department of the Interior have been incredibly great. We are now conducting follow-up calls for these states to see you know, how they're faring on the goals that they establish at these forums. And the FEMA and Department of Interior regional environmental officers are on the calls because these are the people, they, they understand the importance of connecting and establishing relationships with these people. So one of the things that we asked, we asked if we had a pre-survey, um, a pre-form survey that we conducted of the people who were attending. And one of the questions was, of my state colleagues attending this forum, I know. So some of them, I mean, it was good. Some of them knew each other. Um, very few from the cultural community had a point of contact at their emergency management agency prior to this forum. And I have to say there were many states in which the cultural agency delegates didn't know each other, even though they might have been in the same building. So it took getting them away from their desks 
to a neutral place to be able to start this dialogue. And it was great. It was wonderful to say this. You know, I should have been, you'd hear this, we should have been in touch years ago. You know, you worked just three floors above me. Um, it's really great to be able to establish those, to foster that, those kind of relationships. In the survey, 60% uh, of the participants had responded to a major disaster in their professional capacity. Um, just over half had a defined role. And by the end of the forum, we really wanted the other 44% to begin defining and shaping their role. If you're in the state, um, it, you should feel a responsibility to your constituents to help them out in any way you can. The forums kick-started that all-important dialogue um, on how state agencies can communicate, collaborate, and cooperate to protect cultural resources. And so we had a lot of brainstorming sessions, breakout sessions. We had um, these uh, easel post-it pads spread out around. That was the sign of achievement. By the end of two days, we had the walls covered with these, with these posters. Um, and here's an example of how this initiative has already paid off. Back in June of this year, uh, there was a black forest fire in Colorado. This, there were a number of forest fires. This is the black forest fire near Colorado Springs. Back in 2010, an Alliance for Response kickoff forum had been held in Denver. And that group coalesced very quickly and became the leadership team for their cultural heritage emergency network. And they are called CARA, the Colorado <coughs> Cultural and Historic Resources Alliance. C-C-A-H-R-A. -A. So CARA identified and reached out to cultural institutions and historic properties in the affected area and coordinated evacuation response and recovery activities for their cultural institutions. There weren't a huge number, but they were able to reach out to all of them. And because the network comprises representatives from both the cultural heritage community and the emergency management community, um, certainly from the emergency Office of Emergency Management, the communication and collaboration was seamless. And so while that alliance was busy helping institutions evacuate collections, they said, you know, we really don't have anything about recovering materials damaged by fire. So we put together a press release that was then distributed widely and appeared on the Office of Emergency Management site on how people, the public, can, can recover their materials damaged by fire. It was also distributed to libraries and other media outlets, which was really great to see, because oftentimes if we don't know anybody in the state, we're casting about blindly, hoping someone will pick this information up, and in most cases, it isn't. So having connections to the state will ensure that um, we're able to get information out to the state agencies who can then pass that information along to their constituents. CAR was again called upon in September when torrential rains inundated Colorado once again. And so this is um, a bridge, a destroyed bridge in Lyons, Colorado on September 13 of the year. CARA helped spread the word on salvaging photographs and other keepsakes and continues to support the cultural and heritage communities on the long road to recovery. So CARA is a model um, cultural Heritage Emergency Network, and all the Cultural Heritage Emergency Networks that have been set up are really doing, making great strides, whether it's um, just getting that dialogue fostered and trying to get, make the case to the administration, or forging ahead like Colorado did on many different levels. So we look forward to sharing that information, not just with the states that participate in our forums, but in, with all the states. And um, more importantly, with the lessons they've learned and what, how they were able to apply those lessons. And so we have a blog. Currently, uh, the URL is here for the State Heritage Emergency Partnership. And as part of the grant, IMLS has given us funding to create a much more <coughs> robust website where all the resources that are suggested and are developed by states uh, will be available. And I encourage you, if you want, to sign up for the blog. It's available. Uh, there's a follow button in the lower right hand corner and it will give you um, a huge range of, of resources that you can use and we're also at the same time working on on improving Heritage Preservation's Alliance for Response web pages so again those kind of resources are, are currently buried under each state and to be able to give you access to, to enable easier access to those uh, resources will make it much easier for you to R&D 
what's been happening in great places all over our great country. So that's it. Um, I'd like to quote what Mona said, we still have a long way to go. But I think if we look back on where we've come since certainly Hurricane Katrina, the cultural heritage community has made great strides and will continue to make great strides as long as it starts at the local level and we continue to foster that as best we can. So thank you very much.